Now this is a story all about how the site got flipped just like a house. And we'd like to take a minute, just sit right there. We'll tell you how we built this website without losing our hair. In June 2010, Treehouse was engaged to build a Drupal website because it's all the rage. Nodes and blocks and views are cool. Training team members like it's Drupal school. With a couple of maps, find a place that's good. Narrow it down to your favorite neighborhood. Write some reviews, but not about your cat. This is sit back, relax. Let's let us tell you about Zagat. <laughs> And despite what you might think, you are not in Yo Drupal Raps. This is actually the Zagat.com case study session. Uh, my name is Stephen Merrill. I'm Brian McMurray. And we both work for the uh, agency formerly known as Treehouse, uh, which is to say that we both work for Phase 2 Technology. So my name is Stephen Merrill. I'm a director of engineering at Phase 2 Technology. You can catch me at Stephen Merrill on Twitter. And I'm Brian McMurray. I'm a developer at Phase 2. You can catch me on Twitter at B McMurray. Uh, so today what we wanted to talk to you about is Zagat.com. Uh, how many of you know what Zagat is? How many of you knew that Zagat is pronounced like the cat? Awesome. Yeah, they actually have that in a, uh, in a poster when you enter their office because nobody gets it right. It's always Zagat or I thought it was the German pronunciation, Zagat or something. But no, it's, it's definitely Zagat. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Zagat was founded in 1979 by Tim and Nina Zagat. And Tim and Nina Zagat are lawyers by trade. Um, but you know, it, it so happened that they would go out for dinner with friends and they would sit down afterwards and kind of reminisce on how their dinner was. Uh, you know, and they'd actually do the start of their kind of user surveys. And so before the Web 2.0 term for user-generated content was coined, they were actually producing uh, user-generated content. They would aggregate the results of restaurant surveys and then they would publish them. So Zagat's primary business is publishing these books of Zagat ratings, which takes aggregate reviews from folks and then has editorialized reviews to give an overall Zagat score for food and for service and for decor. And they have had a website, but they, uh, they wanted some help with it. Uh, yeah, so uh, Zagat.com, they asked us to come in and work with them to migrate their site from an ASP.NET legacy site that they had had for close to a decade to Drupal 6. Uh, we worked with uh, Zagat from around June 2010 to November 2011 is when I was the ra last one to roll off the project. Uh, if you haven't heard of them before, Zagat is called the Gastronomic Bible by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, what we found when we got into this project is that there was a number of problems that Zagat was facing uh, and that's why they wanted to build a new website. And throughout the course of this session, what we'd like to do is share with you some of the solutions we found that helped make this project super successful that we think can help you make large migration uh, projects also successful. A few of the problems that we ran into with uh, Zagat.com migration is that they had this legacy ASP.NET infrastructure. Their website was nearly a decade old. Uh, updates to the website were very difficult. Uh, the, the deploy process was very manual. Uh, the, team, the entire infrastructure team would have to come in at 8 a.m. in order to do a deploy. And that meant sm like moving code manually to another server, smoke testing it by hand, and then flipping some switches to actually push the code live. That meant that they couldn't deploy very often, and bug fixes and new features were very, very hard to implement. Uh, also, what Zagat wanted was to build a new website. They have a lot of competitors now on the web. You've probably heard of most of them. Uh, and those competitors are very social. Uh, their website was falling a, a bit behind, and they wanted to catch back up, be able to share restaurants to Facebook and have people log in, uh, write comments on the site, et cetera. Also, they had three separate systems running on totally different infrastructure. They had their website running on .NET. They had a blog, which was actually WordPress, hosted externally. And then they had a web store, an e-commerce store that was running legacy ASP code, not even .NET. So some of the solutions that we came up with, we'd like to categorize them under the following topics. Uh, fight for the users, Drupal and friends, robots for better living, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Eye on the prize. 
and hindsight is 2020. So let's talk about fighting for your users. Uh, perhaps you've heard that phrase if you watched the, the recent Tron Legacy movie. But really what we're trying to get at with that idea is that your users are important and knowing who they are and what they want is the best thing you can do to help your project succeed. Uh, how we did this on Zagat is through iterating quickly through uh, real ideas and testing them with real users. We had uh, formal in-person user testing and we also used online tools to help us continually test as we worked on new features throughout the system. Also tracking your users and knowing what they're doing if they're getting to the goals, the things that you'd like to see them accomplish is very important and using, and there are a lot of great analytics packages out there that can really help you know what your users are doing and, and where they're having trouble. So let's talk about user testing. With the Zagat.com uh, design process, we actually had in-person formal interviews. That means we asked people who were already subscribers to Zagat.com to come into the office and sit down with a functional prototype. Uh, what's funny about this project is we actually had planned to just do HTML and JavaScript functional prototypes to test the idea. Uh, but because Drupal is so great, we actually were able to have a working Drupal prototype for our user test. So they were actually able to do real searches uh, with real data uh, for that, that test. When a person would come in for that user test, they would be given a script and asked to sit at the computer and talk through and attempt to accomplish those things. Tasks were simple like find a restaurant that you're interested in going to. Uh, as the site went on, as, as development continued, we weren't able to continue bringing lots of people into the office all the time to all sit and watch them with video cameras. Uh, so instead we used a service called usertesting.com, which allowed us to do the same sort of idea, upload a user script of, of tasks that we'd like a, a user to do, and then on their own time, the members of usertesting.com will go in and a screen capture is taken with audio uh, and they attempt to walk through those same paths. Moreover, as we are really doing the full development, we are constantly making new features, after, uh, continuing after site launch, and we needed to be able to test some of those features without exposing them to the, the regular population. So we did this through Drupal's users and groups and permissions uh, built-in functionality. We were able to create beta permissions that wrapped around the new functionality we were, we were building or planning to deploy for the site and then uh, give those permissions just to a special beta user role and then offer that information through a special promo code uh, for when signing up onto the site that allowed people to be put into the beta user role, access new features that others couldn't yet. So in that way we were able to actually test uh, new features on the live website after, after we had launched. Yep, and another thing that you'll see based on the, the two screenshots that are on the, on the slide up there uh, is that we actually made some changes to the home page uh, just on the basis of user testing. So if you look on the left, you'll see, I know it's kind of zoomed out, but you've actually got a home page with a lot of information. That was the advanced search, and that used to, in early prototypes, default to being on. But it's actually got a lot of information on there. Based on your IP address, it's got uh, the different filters for cuisine. It's got the different neighborhoods near you. It has all the sliders for what food score or cost you want to use. And while a lot of the high up stakeholders and product owners really like that interface, in repeated user testing, we found that folks actually were just confused when really, for almost all of them, all they wanted to do was to go and select, say, Chicago and type in pizza. And then they could do the refinement later on. So through this process of iterative user testing, we managed to make it so that the advanced search that's shown up there was first defaulted to be hidden, and then later on for front-end performance reasons, we actually made it not even part of the page and loaded it in via Ajax if someone actually wanted it. And that's just one example of actual user testing that got us an interface that was a lot easier for the majority of our users to use. So I'd like to show you guys a quick video, a snippet from one of the usertesting.com uh, feedbacks that we got. And to set the stage, this is a user. He's attempting to find a Chinese restaurant uh, in the Chicago area. And uh, what you'll see is that he'll actually struggle. He'll, he'll show us a bug in our own code and then uh, ultimately succeed. So here we go. And in true user testing form, it breaks. 
All right, well, so the idea is, I'll, I'll explain the video since you can't see it. Uh, this user, he's uh, attempting to switch his location from Naperville, Illinois to Chicago, Illinois, and he just goes up to the top search bar, he types in Chicago, and he hits enter, and nothing happens. And then he hits enter, and then he hits enter, and enter, enter, and enter, and he gets really frustrated that this just isn't working. And then he sees the autocomplete shows down and shows Chicago, he clicks that, and it finally works, which shows him the restaurant uh, information that he's looking for. Uh, what's really strange or, or interesting about these videos is that we, we found bugs, certainly like that one, uh, like this one, uh, and also we discovered insights about how our users understood the data. So in some instances, they didn't understand what the Zagat scores mean. The, the Zagat score, if you're, not, if you're unfamiliar, is out of 30, and if you're used to using Yelp or something, it's, I believe, out of five or out of 10. So it was just a strange metric, and people were a little confused by what that meant, and that helped us know to build more information into the site that explained that to the users. Along with uh, user testing, tracking uh, your goals and your analytics was really important. We made great use of the Google Analytics module for Drupal and all of the functionality that comes right out of the box with Google Analytics. We also used some of the advanced features in Google Analytics, like setting up goals so that we could track whether a user was successful in registering for the site, uh, whether they made it to a restaurant page in an appropriate number of clicks, et cetera. Another really interesting analytics package that's out there that you might find useful for your own projects is called Crazy Egg. Crazy Egg is an analytics software that allows you to track exactly where your users click and look on the page. So it can actually show you how, they, how and where your users scroll the page and where they spend their time. We use this a lot when iterating designs, particularly on the restaurant details area of the site, to figure out where users were spending their time, if they were even making it down the page, and uh, knowing which content to sort of move up the page and make the best experience. We also use Google Website Optimizer, which allows you to do A-B testing, multivariate testing, uh, to try out different ideas of uh, things like subscription upsells. So a subscription upsell is something we called an ad that would encourage you to sign up for a paid subscription on the website. And we would try out different designs, different language, using Google Website Optimizer to see what was the most successful thing for us. So I'd like to talk about Drupal and friends now. And I have to say, either Brian or I must have done something really bad in a previous life if the demo gods bit us when you're using a pre-recorded video. So we're really sorry for being terrible people. Um, but anyway, for Drupal and friends, uh, and any large website deployment, you're really not going to be able to get by just using standard Drupal and the LAMP stack. There's going to be other complementary technologies that you want to bring in. It could be Varnish, it could be Solar for search. There's a lot of things that enter into the ecosystem. So for any large deployment, you are going to end up using some amount of complementary technologies to augment. And in addition, uh, when using Drupal, you obviously choose Drupal for the open source mentality, for the ability to have a number of contrib modules. And so our mantra was always to try and find that 80% of the site that we could build using contrib modules or even the API of contrib modules, and then use that custom code that's either completely custom or that interfaces with contrib modules to get us 100% of the way there. So one of the items that we did on Zagat.com was some dynamic charting. We used a library called RaphaelJS, and RaphaelJS is a vector graphic abstraction library. Basically, it allows you to draw dynamic vector graphics or charts onto the page using JavaScript. Um, normally, you're going to draw these in SVG. SVG is an XML format for scalable vector graphics. You put XML nodes into the DOM, and you get these scalable, zoomable vector graphics. Now, one of the reasons that you're going to want to use Raphael is that certain browsers, <coughs> Internet Explorer, uh, don't actually render SVG. Internet Explorer 9 and above will render SVG graphics, but Internet Explorer 6 through 8 don't. They had their own proprietary format called VML, which is the vector markup language, which is very similar, but of course different. But if you're using Raphael to draw these scalable graphics, it'll actually detect what browser you're using and draw the right version of them. In addition, when using Raphael, 
um, and using SVG in particular, you get good browser compatibility. It works on IE6 and up, it works on desktop browsers, but most importantly, it works on mobile Safari and Android 3 and up. So for your iPhones, your iPads, and even your Android tablets, any interactive or vector graphics that you make are gonna, are gonna work. And so that was one reason to choose Raphael instead of Flash. So let me show you how we used Raphael in the site. We used it in something we called the matrix. Uh, there were a lot of matrix jokes made. Uh, the matrix is a, is a graph, another alternative way of viewing the search results for restaurants in the site. And the way that it worked is that it mapped the restaurants as these green dots on the screen here onto a, onto a matrix of food score on the vertical axis and cost on the, on the horizontal or bottom axis. And what this did is what it created a graph that we called bang for your buck. So basically you could see at a glance a number of restaurants. In this uh, screenshot here you're looking at a search for Italian restaurants in Manhattan's West Village. And these are the top 10 results. So of these results, many of them are very highly rated and the one that is most likely best for you or if uh, economy and good taste is what you're, you're into is the most upper left corner. Um, what was, you know, this is great and, and could certainly be done in any number of ways, but because Raphael is interactive, we were able to give you a little more information. Just a dot doesn't tell you much about what the restaurant is. So, just simply mousing over any of those dots would give you what we called an info window, which you could then click on the dot to anchor to the page and then drag and drop it around to uh, be able to bring up multiple restaurants and compare them one at a, or side by side. Uh, and then further, if you wanted to find out more about a particular restaurant, you could just click the name of it, you know, just like any, any normal search results link. All right, so next up I'd like to talk about how performance matters and, and what techniques we use to improve Zagat's front end and back end performance. Uh, so I'm gonna talk mainly about doing varnish and then we'll both talk about some, some approaches we took to increase Zagat's front end performance. So varnish is a reverse proxy cache. Uh, what it does is more or less it sits in front of your web servers and as requests come in to Varnish, it will try and cache them. Uh, it's very good at caching static files and it's exceptionally good at caching content for anonymous users. So if you have Varnish active on your site, you'll know that uh, once your first anonymous user hits the site, the next X requests, say for the next 10 minutes, are gonna be exceptionally fast. Varnish is also very good at protecting from traffic spikes, and when Zagat got acquired by Google, Varnish kept them humming nicely when there were tons and tons of folks headed to the Zagat.com homepage. Um, it's also very good about protecting your back end, which is your Apache in this case. If you are getting hammered by traffic, let's say you got linked on Daring Fireball or Reddit, uh, what it'll do is, as you're getting these hundreds of requests per second and the cache expires, it'll send just one request back to Drupal and Apache and will serve stale content for an extra 10, 15 seconds. So Varnish offers a number of enhancements in your back end or your page generation times. And we also took it a little bit further on just a couple pages where we thought this would be useful. We did ESI caching. So how many folks in here have ever written .shtml files, classic server-side includes? Couple folks? So this is pretty much the same thing. Uh, with an ESI, you go in and you put in a special ESI colon include tag. And what this does is it tells your server uh, in front of the web server, which might be Varnish or might be Akamai, to cache the whole shell of the page, but then to go and get that fragment from a different place and cache it on a different time frame. It's not really easy to do. It's actually easy to make your site perform worse if you're bootstrapping Drupal two or three or four times. So you do have to be very judicious with your use of it. But we did use it, for example, on the restaurant details page where most of the information changes very infrequently and only the item that I have highlighted up there is gonna change based on your role on the site. So in other words, you know, you'll get to see those subscriber numbers and you get to see the stats if you're logged in and you can add to lists and if not, you don't. So we can really easily say, cache the shell of the page for up to six hours at a time and then just bring in this one small bit of dynamic content. We also worked a lot on front end performance and we'll talk about um, you know, how we organize sprints around this, but basically front end performance is very important. The, the majority of tutorials you see online are about how to increase your back end performance. You know, they'll tell you about using varnish or memcache to make it so you generate your pages or at least they come from cache in 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. But 
your front end can still make your site load incredibly low. And the end user doesn't care. They don't know that it's actually the front end that's causing your site to load in 10 seconds. So you do have to make sure that both your front end and your back end are optimized. So just a couple of the things that we did on the Zagat site, one of them is spriting. You can see on the right hand side here, we've got about 22 buttons sitting there. The ideal approach for using images or any other extra resource you have to go and get with an HTTP request is to not use it at all. Uh, you might commonly see people use CSS3 to make rounded corner buttons. For Zagat, a lot of the target market did use older IE browsers, so we did use image buttons, but at least we could sprite them together like that. Another one of our discoveries was something called spooning that I'll let Brian tell you about. So we, we coined this term spooning. Actually, uh, the CTO at Zagat coined the term spooning. Uh, because it came from a technique we discovered on one of their competitors' websites, Urban Spoon. Uh, what we noticed as we were comparing our speed to uh, the competitors is that Urban Spoon was consistently beating us and we couldn't figure out why until we investigated a little further and discovered they were delaying the loading of all of their images until after the page became interactive. So they were sort of cheating around how quick the page would load. So we decided that we wanted to try this too. The way this works is that you use our old, old friend spacer.gif and you put that as the source of all of your images in the site. That gif is in incredibly small and it's used for all of those images so it's only loaded once and it's cached and is very, very quick. And then you use a data attribute to include the real path of your image. And then writing some really easy JavaScript, you wait until window.load fires, and then you swap the source. So you use jQuery or something similar to grab that data-source uh, attribute and put it into the real source attribute, thereby triggering all of your images to load. Uh, it's a great trick. It also has a, a few setbacks. So if you try, uh, if, you're, if images showing up in Google Images is important to you, this isn't going to help you. Uh, also, if you're on a really slow connection, you may see, you know, areas of your site that don't have images until all of these things are able to finish loading after the page becomes interactive. We didn't use this everywhere on the site. We used it in just a few small places where uh, we wanted to try and experiment with it, uh, but we found it was a really interesting technique for really speeding up those pages. Next up. Uh if you eat at a lot of Zagat rated French restaurants, let's say, you might need to trim some weight. And similarly, we found that we had to trim the weight off of a couple pages of Zagat.com. Um, you know, the, the less information you can send over the wire, the faster your site's going to load, especially on a slow connection like a mobile phone. So just a couple of things that we did in this case. One was a set of Ajax upgrades. When we initially built the search engine, it was Ajax. But the way that it worked was it would pull basically a full set of HTML into the page and then just kind of put that HTML into the main content div. That was really easy to write, but it wasn't particularly efficient. We actually rewrote it to just send some JSON data to update the facets in the search and the couple restaurants that came back, and that resulted in much less information going over the wire. In addition, we're going to talk about Open Layers in a bit. It's a mapping library, but Open Layers is a pretty big library. Uncompressed, it's like 880K, and that's a lot of information to load on the home page because the home page actually used Open Layers. You could hit an advanced search and do some mapping. So what we did was Open Layers comes with a build script. It has a Python-based build script where you can configure exactly which parts you're using and build a smaller file. Um, other libraries like jQuery UI also let you just grab kind of bits piecemeal. And so with this, we were able to take that 880K file and get it down to about 440K, cut it in half. And when that's gzip, that's actually going to be about 90K. So we managed to reduce the weight of that quite a bit. And then finally, uh, when you're doing measurements like this, you're probably going to use either the Net tab in Firebug or the Network tab in Google's rather Chrome or WebKit's uh, Web Inspector. And you can get nice waterfall views, but how do you share those with your team? You could certainly you know, snapshot those. But there is a standardized format called HAR, which is just a JSON file. It's the HTTP archive format. And if you want to export those and view them later, there's a couple tools. One of them is called HAR Viewer, where you can just paste that JSON file. Or there's another open source product called ShowSlow. You can go to showslow.com or you can host ShowSlow inside your own firewall. And what this will let you do is, in addition to sending HAR files, you can have YSlow or PageSpeed send the results there, and then you'll have them for uh, future analysis. So 
we did a couple sprints related to front-end performance as we were getting ready to launch. We felt good about our back-end load times. And this is an example of what we did with the competitor information anonymized. So Zagat is in the orange and the competitors are in the grays. We started out, this is the home page for an anonymous user with an empty browser cache. And we started out around four seconds, and we were actually still faster than two of our competitors. Uh, and you can see that even in just a week worth of work, we managed to get that down to two seconds. And finally, by the time we launched, we were right around one second load time. So you can make a pretty good difference. But our search page, which is actually probably the most commonly used one after the home page, we did even better at. We started out at over 10 seconds with an empty browser cache, which is really quite a bit of time. And we managed to get that down in the first sprint, even down to four, and then down under two. And we still were about maybe at one and a half when we launched. So by using some of these techniques, you can really speed up your site. And again, the visitor doesn't care if it's back end or front end, they just want it to be fast. So let's talk about how we used some uh, common contrib modules to really succeed on this site. Uh, as we mentioned before, a lot of stuff in the contrib community can get you really far, and in some very speci specific cases, we decided to go custom. But let's talk about how contrib really came through for us. Uh, one of the big features of the new Zagat.com site was this idea of social badges. If you're familiar with Foursquare or other gamif gamified sites, you've probably seen badges all over that reward you for your uh, behavior inside of the site. We wanted this, and we were able to pull this off very elegantly with the flag module and rules module. So flag was just used as flags on the user that were given to them when they uh, were awarded the badge, and we used rules to automate when those badges were, uh, those flags were applied. So for instance, if you wrote a review in two different cities, you could get the Jet Setter badge, or if you connected with Facebook, you could get the Facebook Connect badge, et cetera, et cetera. A few other areas that were really big uh, contrib wins for us were the blog. As I mentioned before, uh, Zagat had a WordPress install for their blog that was hosted separately. And, and the first thing we needed to do was get all of that content. And that's where Migrate module came in. Huge help for us. We were able to get all of that content into Drupal very, very quickly and very easily. We had a number of different blog content types that were built with you know, standard CCK and Drupal content types. And of course, if you've ever built a blog on Drupal, you've probably used views, and so did we. Uh, it, it came together really great. We were able to have a, a great blog that was localized by city, and uh, the blog editors had many different types of blog entries they could create, like multi-page photo albums, reviews about specific restaurants, generic blog posts, et cetera. Another big win for us was open layers in, in the maps. The site launched with a number of really cool features for allowing you to search on the map itself. And we used open layers to really help us out with this. We had the geographic data for all of the different uh, neighborhoods inside of Manhattan, for instance, and other major cities. We were able to use open layers to draw those uh, boundaries onto the map and make them selectable options within the search interface. So. We were very lucky on this project to have the man who wrote the book on mapping in Drupal, Thomas Turnbull, working at Zagat to write some great plugins for open layers that really allowed us to do great search like by neighborhood, proximity, and near major landmarks. We also were able to use Contrib out of the box to create a web, a web store, the shop. When the site launched, we actually launched with the, their legacy ASP shop uh, because we just didn't have time to get to building it into Drupal. But immediately afterward, we started prototyping with different ideas for how we could build a shop that integrated better with the subscription process. Ubercart was the winner for us in this case. We were able to create a really great looking shop that uh, bundled in uh, to the subscription ser service so you could sign up for the site, pay for your subscription, and also buy some books at the same time, something that Zagat had never been able to do before. All right, and then of course, Contrib got us 80% of the way there, but there were still some parts of the site where we had to go custom. The main two that I'd like to talk about are the search and the paid online subscriptions. So for search, um, 
one of the areas that Zagat had deep experience with another product was in their search. They used a search server called Indeca. It's somewhat similar to Solar in that it is a Java-based search service, um, but it has a number of advantages. One of them, of course, was that Zagat was intimately familiar with it, but another one was that it had an, a UI, an actual Windows application where users could go in and write pipelines. So you could drag and drop and say, I want to import this file, and I want to tokenize it in this particular way, and then I want to split it up like this. And in Solar, that's an XML file. So obviously, their, their producers were used to building these search pipelines in the app, and so we felt no need to get rid of Vendeca uh, for solar. Also, Ajax refreshing of results was something that we needed. So what we did was to integrate with Indeca, we built uh, a set of REST services, JSON-based, on top of Indeca. And so we could get a number of different JSON services that returned the results that we needed to. And there were several different searches. Um, we also integrated this with subscription upselling. So the, the whole search results page was a custom page callback in Drupal. And we could do different integrations. Obviously, if you're not a subscriber, you don't get access to the Zagat ratings. But we could actually have certain things be sponsored. So you could say that you know this particular restaurant's ratings today are sponsored by Drinkwell or by MasterCard. Or once in a while, the editors could also go and give some free samples. We could say, hey, for these 20 restaurants in Manhattan, we're going to run a free sample. Um, there's also multiple search interfaces, as I mentioned. So there's the home page search, which does things slightly differently from the search page search. The search page search is also going to search for blog posts, for example. We got that information back into Indeca. And finally, every single page on the site actually had a search bar. Search was the number one drive of navigation in the Zagat site. We also built a custom autocomplete for all of those search interfaces so that people, if they were in New York, could start typing the name of a restaurant, and after they had three or four characters, an autocomplete box would come up. Integrating with their subscription backend was another thing that we did write custom. So we had to integrate with their payment processor and also with the Zagat backend, which was an MS SQL database, a revenue reporting database. Um, there were also many different discrete data points that made up the way that you could describe as a GAT. So there was a system for promo codes and a system for different subscription offers, which were different kind of upsells to join the site. Uh, as Brian mentioned, once we had the shop, we could bundle together subscriptions and products. And finally, we ran different partner promotions as part of the online subscription tool. However, when writing out the custom subscription backend, we still did hook into Contrib API. So one of the things that we built were subscription offers. And to do that, we actually made these subscription offers CTools exportables, and we used the CTools export API to get a nice API for editing, deleting, and cloning subscription offers. So this is an email from a producer at Zagat, and it says, subscription offer tool rocks. Thank heavens for that clone feature. It made it very easy for me to create the SEM landing pages, 28 pages, but each fell within one of four copy HTML versions. So super simple and efficient. Thanks, guys. So certainly not every Drupal admin interface has your producer saying super simple and efficient. So if you can find a contrib module that's going to give that, absolutely go for it. So next up, I'd also like to talk about robots for better living. Um, in this case, we're specifically talking about automating deployments, doing performance monitoring, and using automated processes to check for regressions. So we use Jenkins on this project. Jenkins is a part of any project that we can absolutely bear to, to bring it into. Uh, Jenkins is a Java-based continuous integration server, and more or less, anything that you can write a bash script or a batch job for, it can automate. The most common thing you're probably going to automate is some sort of drush job. So one of the things that Zagat had a need for was for data imports. They had a number of different sources of information. We had to pull Indeca files into Drupal to import them using feeds. We had to take blog information and ship it out to Indeca. And we had to take Indeca files from a utility server and put it onto the Indeca servers. All of these things were one or more chained together Jenkins jobs. Another thing that you'll commonly use Jenkins for is for deployment and specifically for continuous integration. So we can automate deployment for the dev environment, for example. Anytime someone pushes to the dev repo, we can run simple tests before that deploy. We can actually yell at people in IRC if they break the build. So you can be like, ah, Smeryl, I think you broke the build on that one. And then you can stop code from hitting dev if you have simple test failures. Another big thing we mentioned that users used to have to come in at 8 AM to do a release. And one of the things that we did was we empowered QA people to push and to do deploys. We used the Mercurial version control system for the Zagat project. Uh, one of the reasons for that was compatibility with Windows, as most of their folks were on Windows. And so we had Tortoise HG, which is the nice graphical uh, HG viewer on a Windows server. And users would actually just log into this server, 
push code from one repo to another, and then a deploy would automatically start. So on a daily schedule, the QA folks would release to production in the morning, and then push a new build to QA, and then to stage, and then to production again the next morning. It was a really big win for them to, have, to be able to do that without having developers involved. Another great use for Jenkins in general is to run cron. Uh, it'll capture the console output of that, and it can also email you, but unlike traditional cron, it can email you only when there's failures, instead of just getting email every single time a cron job runs. Finally, we use Jenkins to do daily tasks to sync between systems. So we could pull the stage database down to dev every single day so that we had updated files and information in the database. We also used a number of monitoring tools to help ensure that Zagat was performing well and was up. Uh, we had some for looking at real-time stats. We also used Pingdom for uptime and backend monitoring, and then GT Metrics for front-end performance monitoring. So for the real-time stats part of the picture, Zagat did choose to go with a physical hosting provider. And this meant that they had bought this CoRadiant appliance a number of years back. And what CoRadiant is is basically it's a device that you set in front of your, or rather behind your switch, but in front of the rest of your infrastructure. And it can track all of your packets. So you can get a really good idea of exactly how long every request in a user's session took at a hardware level. And we also had a physical Zeus load balancer, which was doing gzipping of our ESI content. Um, and this image up here is actually from the Zagat War Room. So for the day of launch and about a week afterwards, we had this projected up on the wall. The map comes from the Zeus load balancer, and the kind of speedometer comes from the co-radiant device. So we could see every five seconds where our traffic was coming from and how many user sessions we had. As I said, we used Pingdom both to monitor uptime, but it can also give you an idea of backend response time. So this is a graph of backend response times of a particular search in New York City. So with Pingdom, you can get a pretty good overall idea of how your backend performance is trending over time. And the counterpart to that on the front end is GT Metrics. GT Metrics is a free hosted service that uses um, automated scripted browsers to run a variety of front end performance tests. So you can see in the image here, this has run a page speed and a Y slow grade on a particular page. We got a B in page speed and an E in Y slow. And then below that, there's a graph over time. So GT Metrics can run a daily snapshot and track your performance over time. And it can also send a custom cookie if you want to actually like send a session cookie for an authenticated user so you can track that front end performance. Or it can use HTTP auth. So if you have a dev server behind a password, GT Metrics can still check in on your, uh, your front end performance over time. And finally, we did manage to build up a library of automated regression tests using Selenium. We had run these tests on the QA environment, um, and we had a battery of about 80 by the time the project was done. Um, and we used these to catch a good number of regressions. We usually find about eight regressions per two week sprint using them, and sometimes we would then use those to write new tests to ensure that we didn't regress again. Now Drupal 6, which we use for this project out of the box, is not great, um, especially with some of the jQuery and jQuery UI components. So we wrote patches for jQuery update and jQuery UI to upgrade to an ARIA compliant version. And once we did that, it meant that we could test those things, which included the search autocomplete using Selenium. So we can actually go in and say, set my location to New York, type in P-I-Z-Z, -Z, make sure pizza comes up, make sure it has X number of results, or at least a certain number, click on the link, make sure I get a certain amount of results. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Oh, no, no laughs. Uh, what we really thought about this project and what we ran into a lot is that your Drupal site needs more than just Drupalers to succeed. Uh, the Zagat team was fairly large. They had a number of people from, who are, were experienced Drupal developers, but they also had QA, product owners, designers, and sysadmins. What they still needed to grow, though, and they were having trouble finding more qualified Drupalers. So instead, we helped them to sort of look for non-Drupal talent that could brought, be brought in. So here are a few tips that we found on finding non-Drupal talent that can really help your project succeed. Look for folks who are already familiar with contributing to open source. If they're already bought into the ethos and idea of open source, then they're going to be on board with at least entertaining Drupal. Also, you want to look for people who have that spark, who are really interested and driven to continue learning all the time. Uh, a few examples of how this really worked out well for us was a junior developer who had some Linux and CS dabbling background uh, who ended up coming in 
diving headfirst into Drupal and contributed a huge amount of the front end development for the site, which really helped everyone else uh, be able to focus on, on other parts of the, the development. Another example is a contributor, uh, an experienced Linux distribution core committer who had no web experience at all, who was able to come in and write those Selenium tests that we just told you about that helped us keep our project going. And eventually he became the sort of go-to person for all the major sysops in the, in the organization as the Treehouse team moved out. All right, now I just wanna talk about keeping your eye on the prize. Um, as we were approaching launch, we, you know, anytime you approach launch, you're gonna see an uptick in bugs as more and more people are actually looking at the site and finding things that they don't like. Uh, in the case of Zagat, we had a contract CTO, and this was an asset because it meant that he could afford to, um, you know, tell it like it was a little bit more maybe than someone who'd been there for 10 years or who was hoping to be there for 10 years. But the basic thing that, that we used to help get through launch was to say, look, all software has bugs, and although product owners or stakeholders might find bugs, we really need to make sure that we were gonna prioritize fixing the bugs that would affect users, especially users who are not familiar with the site. So that was our mantra, you know, if, if a user without a lot of experience as a GAD would see this bug, that does need to be critical or a blocker. If it's something that only you or a very, very experienced user of the site is likely to notice, let's go ahead and make that a major or a minor. Uh, and using that, we were able to get our launch bug queue under control and get to launch at the time that we had specified. Another interesting thing that happened was that some features were removed from the site as part of this fifth redesign of Zagat.com. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the things that were removed were actually already kind of out of date. There were certain other verticals like hotels that really hadn't been updated for years. Uh, despite that, when the new site launched, we did get a decent amount of pushback from some of the normal users of the site. Um, luckily, this was a small percentage of the users, and the new features did actually drive much more new adoption of the site than those who were concerned about the old verticals that went away. So finally, obviously not every project is perfect, and you do want to take away some lessons from the projects you do. So in our hindsight is 2020 section, I'd like to talk about just two topics, uh, configuration management and some kind of virtualized dev environment. So Zagat actually had a lot of different hosting environments. They had six different environments that were spread out between two different hosting facilities. Four of them were internal, and two of them were at the production hosting provider. Uh, as a result of that, we set up the production hosting environments and then bought new machines for the internal environment setup. But setting up that new group of four internal environments was actually pretty slow. Um, we had many different deploy jobs for many different pieces of the configuration, so there was one separate deploy job for the Varnish VCL config. And there was another one for the many rewrite rules that happened. Um, and there was a big Mercurial repository that had all of these different things in it. So if we had a tool like Puppet or Chef, this would have made our lives a lot easier because we could have had a complete set of configurations for each environment in code and then just moved them up. It certainly would have made things much easier. And in addition, at Zagat, as with many of our large enterprise deployments, we had developers who were on a number of different platforms. We actually had folks who were on Linux and on Mac and on Windows. Um, and so as a result, without a decent amount of work, you had some local environments that were missing some pieces of the stack. Um, not everyone had SSL right away or had the most up-to-date version of the rewrite rules. Or as another example, you can't run Varnish on Windows. There's just no way to do it. So WAMP also would sometimes bite us with unfortunate issues that were unique to the Windows environment. For example, about a month and a half in, suddenly everyone's Apaches started crashing when they had CSS aggregation on. And we wanted them to have CSS aggregation on unless they were doing heavy theme dev. Um, so for a while, we just disabled it while we were looking for the problem. It ended up being a really esoteric thing where Windows default stack size is one meg, and Linux Linux and Max is eight megs. So we finally found that, fixed it, but that took a lot of time that could have been devoted to development. So luckily, there are tools that are designed to ease this sort of pressure. One of them that I like a lot is called Vagrant. Vagrant is a way that you can automate distributing virtual environments to your team. So it works using VirtualBox, and it is a Ruby gem, although it now has binary installers for Mac and Windows, so you can just get a .msi or a .dmg. And when you have a Vagrant file, you can actually distribute a Vagrant file that says go to this URL, download this box, which is a virtual machine. You can then use Chef, 
or Puppet or even just a set of shell scripts to put the right software on it. Generally, you're going to try and keep that initial image as small as possible. And then you can share the doc root to your VM. And what this means is that you can have your Drupal code still on your local file system and just share it into the VM. And the advantage of this is that you don't have to have your team, especially say your designers or your themers, worry about SSHing into the server and doing VI. You can still keep working with Sublime Text or um, Text Edit or Git Tower or Tortoise HG, whatever you like to use in your normal development environment, and then see the changes reflected in that virtual server. All right, so that's about all that we have in terms of our experiences with helping to move Zagat onto an open source Drupal platform. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to take them. We just ask that you please go to the microphone in the center of the room so we can get it in the audio recording. So you guys talked about scalability for anonymous users. How did you deal with scalability for the authenticated users? So for scalability for the authenticated users, we did have object caching in place. We were using memcache. And as I mentioned, for some of the actual heavier uh, pages that we did, that ESI caching would actually let us store some of those fragments in varnish so that if an authenticated user had already accessed the stats block in one of the most popular uh, requests, varnish might potentially have the shell of the page and the ESI fragment in there. Uh, another thing that we did in terms of just proving that we were ready to launch, Zagat did have really great traffic numbers for each of the different sections of their site. They had good numbers on, this is the peak number of searches per second we've seen, peak number of user registrations we've seen, um, peak number of accesses to say per se or one of their restaurant pages. And so we set benchmarks and said, at launch we want to be able to do at least double all of these. We want to know that our new system can do that. And we did kind of a week you know, near the end where we did some really heavy load testing. We found some really interesting bugs too. For example, as we were load testing the subscriptions, which hit both the MS SQL database that Zagat kept and our own system, we found that there was a deadlock bug where if more than a couple people were subscribing at the same time, MySQL would actually, or, I'm sorry, MSSQL would actually time out. Um, we did end up fixing that one, and that was an unexpected consequence of this load testing to say, hey, if we have a bunch of people registering, are we going to be able to handle it? The answer actually turned out to be no until we fixed that bug. But we did manage to get to double our targets on all of the different parts of the site, um, mainly through a combination of a little bit of ESI and really just a lot of tuning, adding some caching, and using memcache. Thank you. Yep. OK, well, if there's no more questions, thank you very much for coming. If you wouldn't mind, we'd love your feedback. Please uh, go to the website and fill out the take the survey form. We'd, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Yeah.